Hi, everyone. Thank you for being with uh, us today in this uh, last uh, moment of the second international conference on policy diffusion and development cooperation. Uh, this was an incredible uh, journey. I'm really happy that we arrived here uh, today. Uh, as you know, the conference was scheduled uh, to be uh, to take place in uh, May uh, 2020, and uh, last March uh, uh, in last year we had uh, all everything set for the conference when we received the, the information, the notice of the the global pandemic. So, as you know, we first uh, start we first wanted to uh, reschedule the the conference to May 2021. Uh, but later on, we found that we we thought that it wouldn't be uh, still possible to make an in-person conference uh, even in uh, 2021. So we decided to go online. And uh, at that time, I think it was a, a very uh, good decision because uh, we are still uh, in in uh, uh, circumstances where we can't uh, have an in-person uh, uh, conference. So uh, the event. Uh, was uh, was all online as you know and uh, it was the, the right decision we made uh, so uh, doing the conference online also implied for us to reorganize everything and adapt uh, the event and uh, at that time we knew nothing about uh, how to organize a conference online and it was a sort of a learning by doing process a lot of work as well and I'm really happy with uh, the, the the results. Uh, we of the, the the commission, we are happy with the result, and we also hope that you enjoyed the discussions. Uh, if you participated in panels, if you presented papers, or if if you were in a, presented something in webinars uh, or in any other activities that were organized during this uh, conference. So, what I'm going to do uh, today, and uh, we are going to do today in this uh, in this uh, uh, closing uh, event is uh, so first I'm going to present you some information about the results of the conference and how this event evolved since the first time we met this group met in 2016 uh, in a sort of a small uh, workshop and uh, the dynamics are going to be that uh, I'm going to introduce this and then I'm going to hand over the the, the floor to uh, Professor Leslie Paul, who's the Dean of the College of uh, uh, Public Policy uh, at the Hamad bin Khalifa University. Uh, and he's also author of uh, this very nice book, uh, Frontiers of Governance. It's a book about the OECD. Um, and then uh, after uh, Leslie Paul uh, uh, gives his uh, presentation, I'm going to hand over to uh, Eugene uh, McCann, who's professor at the Simon Fraser University, and is author of this uh, very interesting book, uh, one of the first books about uh, 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 policy mobilities, which is uh, uh, called Mobile uh, uh, Urbanism. Uh, I want to uh, inform you that, uh, uh, unfortunately, Professor uh, Claire uh, Dunlop is not going to be uh, with us today, as was uh, uh, in the program, uh, because unfortunately he had a health issue and uh, he can't. He, she, she's not able to join us. But her contribution would be uh, 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 very uh, interesting, and it's a pity not having her uh, here. Uh, so, uh, you can uh, ask questions uh, for the three of us, for me, for uh, Leslie and Eugene. You can ask the questions via the, the YouTube chat. Um, and uh, and uh, and then and, and this is going to be the the, the, the dynamics of this uh, this uh, session. So let me start uh, uh, by telling you a few of the this conference uh, results, and then we move back to the previous ones. So uh, 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 I want to in, uh, start my uh, presentation now. Amiwa, can you put my presentation? Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I uh, we had uh, we had already. Uh, 
uh, we had around uh, uh, 2,000 views uh, so far for the full, uh, uh, the, all the events that we had in the conference. Uh, the panel uh, with the highest numbers of views was the, the session one of panel 14, uh, International Organizations and Development Cooperation with uh, 136 uh, views. Uh, and the other panels uh, had around 30 to 50 um, uh, views. Uh, and the webinar with uh, the, the highest number of views was the first one, the webinar called uh, Policy Diffusion and Global Health in, in Times of COVID-19. And we had uh, around 497 uh, uh, views. Here you have the a graphic with uh, the number of views separated by the type of sessions. And uh, you, you can see that uh, the number of views of the webinars is uh, around the same of the number of views of the all the panels uh, together. Uh, Miwa, you can move to the next one. Uh, yeah, so here uh, you have all the details of the of the of the views distributed by number of by by the the type of uh, of, of session uh, and the specific uh, session. I'm not going to comment uh, this uh, uh, now, but it's just to give you an overview about the 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 dimension of this conference. It's hard to tell how many people really engaged in the conference because one single person uh, might have uh, viewed more than one session, but uh, certainly we reached more than 400 people all around the whole uh, world. Uh, and uh, we had uh, around 60 presentations uh, in the conference, including webinars, roundtables, paper presentations and panels and po posters. So uh, in, a, in a certain way, uh, the impact of this, uh, of this conference uh, was even uh, 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 bigger than the impact of an in-person uh, conference. Uh, if we consider last, the last conference, uh, we had around two, uh, 200 or, and something uh, participants. So here, um, the impact is bigger, and uh, also the number of views of the videos of this year conference is much higher than uh, the number of views in the past conference. So all the the, the 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 plenary sessions of the past conference, the videos are all on our YouTube channels channel, and they they had uh, a smaller. Uh, number of uh, of views. So the result of the conf the, this uh, uh, this conference uh, is uh, comprised uh, thirty videos that are available on YouTube and an ebook that is going to be prepared as the proceedings of the conference. Uh, we also have consolidated a network of more than five hundred contacts, and uh, and uh, and uh, we have this uh, uh, this contacts are from all over uh, the world. Uh, one important information is the fact that in spite of uh, having 2,000 views, most people that have viewed our videos is not uh, subscribed to the YouTube channel. We, we have only 200 uh, subscriptions, something, something uh, like this. So if you're interested on this content, uh, you can subscribe to this channel and like. There is a lot that's going to on here to make a, a, a small uh, propaganda about what's coming next. Uh, in May, we are going to have another cycle of webinars about the sociology of public action, which is going to be in English and is going to have the most prominent French scholar in this uh, area. So that said, uh, I can move to the results, uh, to, to this more substantive part of the results of the conference. Um, so uh, we had different uh, types of this discussion in the different moments uh, of uh, this conference. So starting in 2016, at that time, uh, we were very concerned about revisiting the classic concepts on policy transfer, diffusion, uh, as for example, uh, the, the, the Dolowitz and Marsh uh, uh, framework, and also other approaches. And we were also presenting some emerging uh, uh, issues. 
uh, as for example, the dynamics of uh, resistance to policy transfer, uh, which was one uh, uh, discussion that uh, was started by uh, Professor Leslie Pau, uh, especially thinking about uh, the context of that moment, which was uh, the context of Brexit. You can see all the these videos, uh, the videos of the 2016 uh, event, the seminar, uh, they are in uh, my personal YouTube channel, but I'm going to move uh, the videos to this channel uh, here uh, soon. So at that time, uh, it, it was the moment as well as the book of uh, Magdalena Hadjiski, Leslie Powell and Chris Walker uh, was just published, the, the book called The Public Policy Transfer, uh, Micro Dynamics and Macro Effects. Uh, so we were discussing a lot of these uh, concepts and these issues. And it was uh, somehow a, a first time where we had a panel discussing policy diffusion and development cooperation. It was the moment as well uh, when we had different uh, Latin American uh, policies uh, circulating uh, across the globe. They were showing examples of a different trajectory of policy diffusion and this topic was very present uh, in the debate of course it was in brazil as well so it was uh, easier to highlight this uh, uh, this issue and uh, one of the results of this event uh, the 2016 uh, uh, seminar which was a seminar of uh, uh, international policy uh, international seminar on policy diffusion uh, was the book uh, that was uh, published uh, recently by Rotledge called Latin America and Policy Diffusion. And we had also two special issues on the topic, which one was published by Novos Estudos, the review, and the other by the uh, Brazilian Review of Public Administration. And they are discussing uh, also uh, concept and new issues in the area. Uh, the event grew and in 2018 it was uh, bigger. Uh, at that moment uh, we started to bring more explicitly uh, this uh, junction between policy diffusion and development cooperation and uh, you can see in the sessions, the plenary sessions that are available here in this YouTube channel, uh, that we were highlighting uh, uh, elements uh, such as the role of geopolitics, the role of power in policy transfers, as well as uh, uh, we were highlighting a lot of uh, uh, examples of uh, policy transfer via South-South cooperation. Uh, it was uh, also a moment uh, important for the, the, the discussion in, uh, in this area when uh, Global South scholars uh, had uh, uh, publications in English. Uh, for example, the book of uh, Michele Moraes about uh, the conditional cash transfers, as well as the work of Cecilia Osorio about conditional cash transfers in uh, Latin America were available already in English, uh, as well as the book of Carolina Milorens that was uh, about to come in that moment and my book on participatory budgeting. Uh, all this, uh, this, uh, these different works were already published in English, so available to an international public. So we were uh, at that time as well consolidating this event as a sort of a safe space to discuss together different streams of research about how policy tra travels. Uh, the policy transfer stream, the policy diffusion stream, the policy circulation uh, and the French uh, stream, as well as the policy mobility streams. In the 2018 event, we had, uh, for example, uh, as speakers, uh, Diane Stone, David Dolowitz, uh, Jacin Giordana, uh, Jenny Robinson, Madalena Hajiski, and uh, other uh, colleagues all discussing together, even if they have uh, their particular preferences in terms of approaches about how to understand and uh, discuss and do research on the way uh, policy travels. It was uh, also an important time for uh, conceptual uh, discussions and especially to think about new agents and new directions in uh, policy diffusion. One of the results of this event was the handbook, uh, Policy Transfer, Diffusion and Circulation that is going to be available in uh, Edward Elgar uh, on the 26th 
of March. Uh, and uh, is a compilation of uh, the most uh, different uh, streams of research, uh, instruments of policies uh, circulating around the, the world and uh, approaches and so on. And uh, uh, we had also uh, um, a special issue that was published in Policy and Society called Transnational Policy Transfer. So it was a very important moment. The conference grew, it, it was big. And uh, uh, and uh, and we are we're consolidating uh, this uh, network. Um, Mira, you can uh, 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 stop the presentation now. Thank you. Uh, so this time in 2021, uh, 2020 and 2021, the conference was marked by a discussion of a set of different topics. And Leslie Paul is going to uh, uh, make a few observations. On, on this, so I'm not going to uh, to discuss uh, these elements. But we had a discussion on the methods of research with a panel organized by Chris Walker, uh, discussions about the urban and policy transfers, and two very interesting sessions about Asia uh, and uh, policy uh, diffusion uh, that were uh, very important in this uh, in this conference. And all uh, another. A uh, group of panels that I'm not going to mention here, but I think the newest element, uh, uh, and it was kind of inevitable to to bring this new element, were, was the different discussions about the pandemic and especially how it affected uh, our research. So we discussed uh, in the webinars and the plenaries uh, uh, um, and uh, and other and and this some somehow came. Uh, in different moments on the panels, we discussed the role, for example, of the state capacity in adopting international measures. We discussed the role of time in the, response, the responses to fight against COVID uh, in the domestic level uh, and in the international as well. We discussed also the, the issue of global governance and the competences of global governance to coordinate uh, international res responses. So uh, uh, I believe that uh, uh, these discussions and also the impact of COVID in the area are going to make a profound imprint in the way we research and uh, study policy movements uh, across borders in the following years. And this was a very distinctive uh, uh, element of uh, the, this conference uh, this year. So uh, this was uh, to give you a little uh, overview of the background of the conference, where we started uh, five years ago in 2016, and uh, where we arrived at now in the discussion on policy transfer, diffusion, um, uh, circulation, and uh, mobility. So uh, this is uh, this conference uh, is uh, uh, one of the the most uh, important spaces of discussions of these topics, as well as with uh, a lot of other spaces that are very interesting and uh, are complementary uh, to to the conference and uh, are very important to uh, foster our knowledge and knowledge production about this uh, this phenomenon. So uh, with no further delay, I don't want to take uh, much of uh, your time and uh, more time from the, the other colleagues that are going to speak. I'm going to uh, hand over uh, to uh, Leslie Powell. And then after he, his uh, contribution, uh, his presentation, I'm going to hand over to Eugene McKen. Uh, I'm just going to uh, remember you that you can ask questions uh, directly through the our uh, the YouTube chat, and remember that this event is also being broadcast via the YouTube, the Facebook or page of uh, uh, Labopi. So uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, now uh, I'm going to invite uh, Leslie Paul to um, to present. Hi, everyone. Um, as Osmani said, and thank you very much, Osmani, I'm Leslie Powell. I'm the Dean at the College of Public Policy at Hamad bin Khalifa University here in Doha, uh, Qatar. Now, uh, we're going to have the slides um, 
in a moment, uh, but I have uh, I have Osmani's permission to put in a little bit of a plug and maybe a little bit of background about the college and the university with which I'm uh, affiliated. Um, we HPKU Hamad bin Khalifa University and um, and uh, the college were uh, sponsors of the uh, this amazing conference over the last. Um, number of months and so it's been a great pleasure for us to be able to support this uh, scholarly activity and um, and uh, and um, and be a visible partner in the uh, in, in 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 the adventure that Osmani led us through uh, since January and even uh, even before going back to 2016 as he uh, as he mentioned so let me uh, 30 seconds uh, if I may just about uh, the college because it, it won't be known to many people perhaps in the audience or or those watching but um, uh, CPP, the College of Public Policy, is one of six colleges at Hamad bin Khalifa University. The university itself is 10 years old, so it's a young institution. Um, uh, CPP, the College of Public Policy, is the newest of the six. I got here in July of 2019 to uh, to launch the um, the college, and that meant everything, um, uh, literally launching our uh, our program we have an mpp a masters of public policy recruiting students recruiting faculty and uh, getting all of that in place and of course in the middle of all of that six or eight months into it uh, we were hit with the pandemic and um, that complicated life uh, for us organizationally quite uh, quite a bit um the uh, the university hbku is um embedded within the qatar foundation which is um, a scientific and research and community-based organization um, in um, in Qatar uh, and its uh, dedication to uh, to um, higher education is manifest both through HBKU which is a graduate institution but also a series of or a, a range of partner institutions universities that are part of QF Qatar Foundation so they include uh, Texas A&M uh, for engineering Carnegie Mellon for business and economics related subjects Will Cornell as a medical school, uh, Northwestern University for Communications Studies. These are all undergraduate programs. Georgetown University, again, for undergraduate, uh, but the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. And um, uh, I should say the, um, uh, the French Business School <clears throat> offering um, MBA and executive training. Uh, and one or two other institutions that escape me at the moment, but basically a stable of about eight international institutions that are established um, as part of QF. And then there's a range of research institutes in uh, in the hard sciences and biology and in, um, in environment and in uh, high tech and digital technologies. So it's a super interesting uh, kind of environment. And um, we have an MPP, as I mentioned, uh, which uh, we are striving to ensure is meets the international standards. So as an educational program, it, uh, it's a, a living example of policy transfer. But of course, it's uh, got to be sensitive to the local circumstances. It's taught in English. And um, uh, it has a focus on global policy issues as they connect to the local circumstances. So transfer, diffusion, very much in the DNA of the way that we teach. And we have specializations in areas like uh, energy environment and uh, social policy. So I encourage uh, and invite everyone to take a look at the website, see what we're up to, and uh, if you're in the neighborhood to drop in. And uh, if there's any aspiring students there who are looking for a good master's program in public policy, then I I'd encourage you, you to give us a look, please. Okay, uh, so... Um, Let's move to the slide presentation. Um, yep, thank you. <clears throat> These are a set of observations that are going to be less um, visually attractive than the ones that uh, Osmani put forward a few a few minutes ago. Um, what I did uh, once we knew that Claire unfortunately wouldn't uh, be able to to participate this evening, what I did was um, try to see if I could step back a little bit from the details of well over a hundred papers um, that uh, or around a hundred papers uh, across what it's 16 panels or so um, and plenaries and step back from the um, the trees to try to get a view of the forest to try to get a sense of the contours um, and obviously I have not read all of the papers I, this is based on uh, skimming and reviewing the titles and some of the abstracts and trying to get and of course participating in some of the panels as well but uh, and it's idiosyncratic to me. You'll see in a moment in the way that I sliced and diced and tried to um, 
parse uh, what I consider to be the key, some of the key features or axes or dimensions of the um, of the of the panel. So um, it's and of course, in some respects, what I'm going to be talking about it by observations are going to be idiosyncratic or particular to this particular conference. So because of course it was under Osmani's leadership with his colleagues in, in Brazil and Latin America, quite properly there's a kind of Latin American, you know, South American um, anchoring to the panels and the papers, although we do, do have good representation on topics and, and also presenters from, uh, from Asia. Had the conference been held somewhere else, then you might have had a different weighting, if you will, of, uh, of regions and such. So the observations we're gonna make are gonna be particular to just the uh, the contours and the profile of the conference as it turned out in this particular time in this particular region, even though it was digital and global, it still was anchored obviously in um, Osmani's shop and in Brazil, uh, and particular to the people that presented and, um, and participated. So with all of those caveats in mind, let me make a, uh, a attempt a couple of observations, again, standing back and looking at uh, the patterns and then making some observations about um, what these patterns might tell us about what we're doing and about what we might be missing. So if I could have the next slide, please. So here is um, a, a summary. Again, I may be missing uh, a few items, but a summary of the regions that were captured. I've got another slide in a moment on the countries, but the regions that uh, were picked up. So obviously Latin America, and the Caribbean and the South American region uh, were, were prominent, Global South, uh, but also the Gulf Cooperation Council, that was uh, a paper that was given in the panel that I was participating in, the European Union, Central America, uh, East Asia, Portuguese-speaking African countries, and the Arctic. Now, these were regional um, tags, if you will, that were connected to the titles, abstracts, uh, and panel titles. Um, and again, I may have missed one or two, but I think this captures most of what was signaled in um, in uh, in the um, uh, the, the vis vi visual representation, visible representation of the uh, of the topics and the panels. So, standing back from this, I mean, what are the regions? It seems to cover quite a a, um, a wide geographical space. But what are the regions that are are missing? And um, the ones that came to my mind were, uh, I guess most obviously my, my background as Canadian is North America. Now maybe that's perfectly appropriate again because of the weighting uh, and centering of the, of the conference. Um, so we had a lot of South America, Caribbean, Latin America um, and, um, and, and the global South uh, quite appropriately. North America, which would be possibly, you know, US Canada transfers, US Canada, Mexico. Uh, not really on the on the radar or uh, uh, strongly reflected. There may have been some references, but not strongly reflected. Uh, Central Asia. There was one paper on uh, Kazakhstan, but the Central Asian region, uh, which I think, um, you know, very clearly for both historical, ethnic reasons, uh, the uh, pre previous affiliation with the Soviet Union, as republics within the Soviet Union all have uh, a, uh, it, it, it's a reasonably well-defined region in those terms. Again, missing here. Um, Africa, for the most part, except for Portuguese-speaking African countries, <coughs> didn't come up very much again. That's characteristic of a lot of international conferences. Unfortunately, our, our African colleagues are not always able to participate as vigorously and as we would like for reasons of distance and cost, et cetera. But um, it, it might appear to be, except again, for this very interesting connection between um, the, the Lusophone countries and, and, uh, and Latin America and South America, it may be a blind spot in, um, in uh, transfer studies from a regional perspective. MENA, the Middle East and North Africa, where I happen to be, um, of course, is reflected in the Gulf Cooperation Council, but MENA represents uh, roughly a dozen countries in the Middle East uh, and North Africa, so going all the way to uh, through Tunisia and, uh, and Morocco. Uh, again, for historical reasons, there are some sense to that um, regional designation of MENA. There's lots of very, very, very strong differences among those countries as well, I can tell you, living in, uh, in one of them now. Uh, but nonetheless, again, it's, um, it's an area that, uh, that it seems to be a bit of a blind spot. Um, and um, so those were, those were broad regions that, um, 
didn't seem to be captured again by happenstance or simply the luck of the draw. But I, I just draw your attention to it. I think, I think from an intellectual or more rigorous perspective, ir irrespective of the happenstance of the way in which the conference was organized, um, the uh, the amount of attention that we pay to Central Asia and to Africa as theaters of transfer is probably um, it, it probably deserves some some uh, some revisiting and rethinking. Uh, the second kind of observation or question that comes up from this is to stand back even further and ask ourselves, what is a region? Uh, how do we define regions? And you can see there's some overlap here, Global South, South American region, Latin America, Caribbean, Central America. Um, we tend to define regions uh, juridically, geopolitically, um, in terms of some shared history, language, ethnicity. But the whole concept of region, I think, is uh, when I was looking at this and, and trying to reflect on it, the whole concept of region and the way we think about transfer may deserve some interrogation and some reflection. And um, uh, ones, for example, like Central Asia um, aren't high on our list here, but clearly qualify, I think, from the perspective of shared culture and, uh, and shared history. So how we think about regions, I think, is something that might be worth some reflection uh, conceptually. Next slide, please. <coughs> um, this is uh, a rough listing of the countries. Uh, Chris Walker, if he's with us and watching, will be happy to see that Australia um, is there, but um, in, uh, in, uh, as a textual representation of its geographical location, we've, I've put it off on, uh, on the side and separated from everybody else by a long distance. Um, you'll see on the far left column, essentially the Central American, South American cluster, Caribbean cluster of, uh, of countries. So these are extremely well represented in the papers. And of course, Brazil, for all the reasons that uh, Osmani cited, um, very well represented. And then you've got a kind of mixed uh, bag, again, with strong representation from Asia, again, as Osmani mentioned, um, and with a few, few France thrown in there, South Africa, uh, Kazakhstan, um, and, uh, and, and Israel. Uh, so, you know, strong representation for Central America, Latin America, South America, strong representation, as Osmani mentioned, for Southeast Asia or South Asia. And, uh, and Australia thrown in there, and, uh, and then just a, a, a smattering of, uh, of other countries. Once again, um, I don't want to make too much of this, but um, it's worth asking what's left out. Um, you know, the obvious one uh, is, even though the European Union is mentioned in one or two papers uh, from a regional perspective, transfers within the context of the European Union. Uh, particularly with strong leading countries like Germany and France, um, not not represented in the um, in the papers. Um, the the one that struck me as perhaps most important um, for long term or medium term thinking about transfer policy transfer issues is the role of China. Again, there were a number of papers on on China. I think three by my count, maybe a little bit more in terms of what they might have brought if they brought China in as a case study or a reference. But if you think about the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, BRI, uh, it's not policy, at first blush, not necessarily policy transfer, it's infrastructure transfer, it's financial transfer, it's fiscal transfer. Um, but it certainly, I think, brings policy transfer in train. And uh, BRI is also connected to um, extensions of Chinese commercial activities in agriculture and resource extraction, again, in, in Africa. So I don't want to make too much of this. This is one conference with one particular configuration of papers. Not um, So I, I, you know, I don't want necessarily want to say that there's a, a big blind spot in the field, but it seems to me that uh, for all the reasons that everyone is well aware of in terms of the importance of China increasingly day by day, week by week geopolitically, that getting a better handle on the impacts of China in both its immediate region, but globally through BRI and other initiatives is probably one of the most important things um, on our long-term, medium-term agenda in terms of policy transfer. Uh, next slide, please. 
institutions and uh, actors. Um, these were, again, the ones that were most directly and immediately referenced. I'm sure the papers were referring uh, to a range of others, but these were the formal ones that came up in the, um, in the, in the titles um, that were listed in the program. Um, so the usual suspects are there, the World Bank, um, the OECD, uh, again, because of the, uh, the emphasis on Brazil and Brazil's role in policy transfer, uh, Brazilian international development agencies, uh, the UN. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so um, what is, what is again, I'm just looking at this and standing back, is there, what are the sorts of things that are missing here? This goes back in a way to uh, Osmani's references or comments to the 2016 uh, first initial conference where we really were wrestling with the Dolowitz and March kind of framework and looking at actors and very much as, as he pointed out again, um, we did have a session on international organizations that was the was extremely well attended. So international organizations um, are are a, a key actor in the transfer diffusion literature, in terms of uh, of of the of the dynamics and mobility policy mobilities. Um, but um, the 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 so so they're represented here and reflected in the uh, in the program. What I don't think was uh, picked up as much, though it was there in 2016 when we were thinking about the full range of actors, along with international organizations, we were thinking about uh, business associations and business activities, standard setting organizations, um, think tanks, the development banks. So um, it may again be that um, this is idiosyncratic to this particular conference, but it does force us to think about a range of different actors uh, that uh, that may have been off the, off the table in terms of uh, of the topic selected for discussion at this this conference, and of course, from a conceptual perspective, I think um, we have to be careful about um, about ensuring that we understand the relationships among those actors, so that a World Bank or an ILO or an OECD or a UN is not just an international governmental organization, but it is connected to academic institutions, to business associations, to stakeholders, to, um, uh, to development banks, and on and on and on. So we have to understand these actors, both in terms of their individual characteristics and their individual contributions to policy transfer, also understand their network quality and the way that they connect with different types of actors um, and uh, act as both accelerators but also force multipliers in terms of transfer activities. Next slide, please. <coughs> um, this is, um, again, a quick and dirty list of policy fields. What's not reflected here, because this is drawn primarily from the titles and the abstracts, what's not reflected here, as Osmani pointed out, is the very strong thematic presence throughout the conference of the pandemic and, uh, and COVID and governmental and policy responses to it. So I don't wanna uh, belittle that effort or that emphasis. It just didn't come up in the, in, uh, in the paper titles and, uh, and abstract as such, even though it was an important theme. And again, Osmani alluded to some of the very interesting discussions uh, that uh, the, the pandemic forced us to have and to rethink uh, in terms of some of the dynamics that we've taken for granted, as he mentioned, just one of them, time pressures and what that means. The other one that came up that was uh, part of the panel that I was participating in on small states was the extent to which in the pandemic, in the COVID context, small states appear to have done better in terms of dealing with the pandemic than uh, larger states. So, the, you know, the exemplars were New Zealand, Singapore, Taiwan, as small states, uh, and um, uh, versus the United States, even Canada, um, uh, small population, large geographically, but but most of the the OECD countries. So, the actors, uh, the countries you would have expected to do well in terms of size fiscal size, fiscal capacity, government capacity, actually didn't do that well at all. It was small states. Again, there's some peculiarities. Most of them were, or many of them were bordered and boundaried and island states, but uh, nonetheless self-contained. Nonetheless, there's something intriguing there about the role of small states in policy diffusion that hasn't been picked up typically in the, um, in the literature. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time I'm away from Gene. So let me step back from this. There are what, what seems to be <coughs> missing here as a, um, um, 
We've got social policies, um, uh, some um, economic, um, we've got immigration, defense, gender, um, uh, vocational, you know, all of that stuff. The, the, the one big policy area that, that I thought might have had more attention paid to it is climate change and climate related policies. Uh, from a policy diffusion and transfer perspective, it would seem to me that that is kind of the Uber policy framework globally and increasingly. SDGs might uh, qualify as well, but the two are increasingly inter interlinked and the SDGs are coming up for, for review and discussion and I think are going to um, rededicate themselves to a climate focus. So the extent to which um, uh, climate change policies through the Paris Agreement increasingly become a driver or a mechanism for coordination around a, or across a range of policy areas from carbon taxes in the taxation field to um, infrastructure development and public transport and uh, house insulation and you name it. Everybody knows that almost everything is connected or seem to be connected to climate change. And so policies right across the spectrum are increasingly harnessed to that framework. So I think that's another area that will deserve some attention going forward in terms of transfer issues and uh, our, uh, our debates within the, uh, within the field. And the last slide, please, I'm not gonna say much about this one, is about methods. Uh, again, gleaned from, uh, from uh, some of the panels that were dedicated to methodological issues. Um, but it, it uh, you know, the, and the, the, uh, the ones that, um, that I think are fairly standard within the field, social network analysis becoming uh, almost a, um, uh, a, a, uh, a basic tool that everyone is, uh, is using, stakeholder analysis, documents, narratives, um, textual analysis. Uh, the ones that come up that, that struck me as being uh, interesting, again, for the medium term and in terms of where the development of the field might go, is things like um, uh, digital media analysis as a mechanism of the transfer of conceptualizations, of ideas, of debates, of arguments. Um, I think um, the digital media really deserve perhaps more attention than we've given to them uh, to this uh, this point. I guess the only other thing I would add to this is, um, and I, I say this cautiously because I didn't read each and every paper, but uh, there's probably less of a kind of quantitative analysis um, and sharp definitions uh, that would allow us to clearly identify what, what constitutes transfer, what doesn't, what, uh, how we would think of proportions of transfer. That's not where my own inclinations lie. But um, the, it may be that there was, uh, a, a, again, an underemphasis on quantitative methods in terms of trying to come to grips with transfer issues. So that is my idiosyncratic take of an idiosyncratic, unique, and wonderful experience uh, and ex experiment, I guess, uh, to some extent um, in, uh, in, uh, in this conference. And, uh, and uh, so I tried to summarize and then step back from those summaries and give some uh, uh, personal comments or reflections about what it might tell us about where we might go in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Les, for this very insightful uh, presentation. I think that uh, if there are any uh, younger uh, academics or people willing to start a research in uh, policy transfer diffusion, circulation, and mobilities, you gave a list of uh, a, a lot of uh, topics that uh, can be interesting. So I also took note and uh, there are some that interest me for maybe the, the future. So thank you very much for this. Uh, and uh, now without further delay, I would like to hand over to Eugene McCann for his uh, uh, presentation. And just remember for the, the, the people that are watching us from uh, YouTube and this live uh, event that you can uh, ask your questions to us three uh via the youtube uh chat so uh, don't hesitate to write uh, comments or questions if you if you want so uh i'd like to invite now eugene mccann uh to uh the floor
So, sorry, Eugene. I think you you have uh, your mic uh, is on mute mode. Um, there, there is, there is probably a button somewhere to unmute. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's below in the screen. Okay, uh, so let's uh, wait a little bit uh, before uh, solving this uh, technical issue, and we'll be back soon with uh, with Eugene uh, McCann. So just a few uh, a few minutes. Okay, I think Eugene is coming back now. Sorry for this issue, Eugene. It's uh, uh, we still I still can't hear you. How about now? Oh, no, oh. good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you well, very much. Um, sorry about that. We had done we had done so well to practice in advance, and it was all working. And uh, who knows technology? Um, okay. Uh, so, so let me start again. Uh, I I want to begin by thanking Osmani and Miwa for uh, organising this conference under such difficult circumstances, and for inviting me to be part of it. Um, <clears throat> I'll also start just briefly by um, by uh, doing a couple of things similar to what Leslie did. Uh, I just want to make a couple of plugs um, for some relevant things. So I'm I'm the managing editor of a journal called uh, EPC Politics and Space. So it's one of the environment and planning journals, that, uh, and it's published by Sage. Uh, Politics and Space is is very open to publishing work on on policy mobilities, policy diffusion, transfer, and so on. Um, if you have work that um, has a clear uh, emphasis on the political and on spatial uh, questions, then it may be a sort, it may be a location for that work, and and we're open to work from all around the world. We are very much an international journal. Secondly, uh, that journal has recently also begun uh, a podcast. We've published one full episode of the podcast so far. So far, uh, the podcast is called Minor Revisions. And uh, the, the purpose of it is to interview people who have recently written papers for the journal and to hear the inside and, and, and uh, behind the curtains story of their writing process and publishing process, which we hope will demystify that process, particularly for more junior scholars and perhaps from scholars uh, outside of the, the more common areas of publishing in the, the Anglophone uh, academic world. So just a couple of plugs. Um, now we could go on to, to the slides, if you don't mind, Miwa. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm also going to read this presentation as a, as a way of, of uh, keeping myself to time or, or close to time, uh, but hopefully hopefully it's still engaging. So uh, as you see there, uh, my title uh, today is uh, Mobilised Ideas and Policy Publics, Reflections on Policy Mobilities in Times of Crises, uh, and crises in the plural. The background image of the slide is from my neighbourhood just down my street here in Vancouver, and uh, it's an example of, of a type of policy that has become much more common, certainly around here and I think in other parts of the world, uh, under the, the conditions of the pandemic, 
where certain local streets have been have been closed to traffic or or traffic has been significantly calmed on them uh, as a way of uh, giving giving pedestrians more space to to walk and to spread out as they walk and that will become relevant at that point as as I go on further in in my presentation okay maybe we could go to the next slide please so the subject of this closing plenary uh, is public policy transfer now, after and beyond the global pandemic. And in my presentation, I want to broaden the discussion slightly. While an, an attention to the pandemic is essential, I think it's worth considering uh, that this crisis is one of a plethora of intersecting crises affecting the world and presenting challenges for policy at the current moment. The climate crisis, the housing crisis, the crisis of racialized injustice, and the poison drug crisis are only just a few others uh, that threaten people's lives and livelihoods individually and in combination. These are political crises in at least two ways. They are objects of governance and they are also moments of organisation and contention as social movements make claims on and beyond the state for recognition and for redistribution. Thus, when I think about policy, I want to think about governance in a more formal sense, but also about the contentious politics that addresses, but also spills beyond the bounds and capacities of states as presently configured. As well as this particular political framing, I'm also a geographer and specifically an urban geographer. So I'm interested and I'm concerned with the sites and the spaces and the scales of political action and policy making, including, including the local scale. This urban political concern was the basis for the conversation about urban policy mobilities a decade ago. And, and I think uh, that it's continued and, and spread to, to other, other groups and, and, and other ways of thinking about this process. Um, thinking about the, the local slash global lens, if you like, um, has quite a lot of merit, I would suggest. So as we consider where next for the policy diffusion uh, literature, um, as a diverse multidisciplinary conversation, I want to share some partial and preliminary thoughts uh, on the place of the political and, and of place in policy mobilities research. So uh, the, the photographs on the left hand side are all from Vancouver in the last year and a year and a half, sorry. Um, and they, they indicate these, these various claims being made in the streets and by social movements and community activists uh, upon the state to change regulation and, cha and change policy. On the right of the slide, obviously, is a plan. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to talk more about some aspects of of thinking about policy in the present and the future, and particularly about uh, about moving policies and moving ideas. Um, and I'm also going to touch on this idea of policy publics and what I mean by that. I'll then talk about about the spaces of that context again as a geographer before making some concluding comments. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> I'll begin by asking what we are studying when we study policy mobilities. I think that we are studying power and the political. And as a geographer, I see that we are all studying we are all studying how policy and politics are constituted and contested in and across space. Many of us are interested in the ideological, institutional, and practical mechanisms through which the world is constituted in its contemporary globalized, unjust configuration. And we are interested in how it's being envisioned and enacted differently by activists, policy actors, and even academics. The study of policy on the move is an entryway into, th into these much broader questions. Political geographer Maria Kuss, uh, echoing anthropologists Chris Shore and Sue Wright, point to this, points to this bigger picture when she argues that public policies are technologies of power that create new relationships objects of analysis and frameworks of meaning. Policy is without doubt a productive force in the world and uh, with, it has socially and spatially variegated consequences. For example, neoliberal policies like business improvement districts, tax increment financing and various forms of privatization are obvious examples of, of circulating manifestations of a hegemonic ideology uh, that has profound consequences for those in its path. They are therefore worthy objects of analysis if we want to focus on 
hegemonic power. Next slide. Yet, if we are to take the present moment seriously, we have to acknowledge the power of contestation, protest and social movements of various political stripes. In other words, we have to recognise the ways in which many people are disaffected from governance and policy making as usual, and feel that they must express their, pol their politics in the streets, on the internet and in other forms of uh, forums outside of the formal spaces of the state. In doing so, they frequently advocate radically counter-hegemonic visions of how, of how crises should be governed, how, by whom, and where. Dori Massey's contribution to mobile urbanism, the book that Osmani showed earlier, um, addressed interlocal, quote, attempts to construct alternative relations that proposed a counter-hegemonic solidarity in which both place and relationality were crucial. The reference to the counter-hegemonic leads us to into the realms of social movements and their networking activities, their messaging and persuasive strategies, and the circulation of their alternative visions, models, and ideas. This may seem to be leading us out of the realm of policy per se. Maybe it is a little, but the ideas expressed on the streets involve demands for radical action on greenhouse gas emissions, the legalization of currently criminalized drugs, the decommodification de of housing, and police abolition, among many other things. These are nothing if not policy issues. Indeed, the introduction to the recent special issue of Policy and Society, edited by Diane Sloan, along with Osmani and Leslie, identifies the following growing focus in the literature. They say, quote, policy transfer, uh, they, they're looking at, quote, policy transfer, not from the centre in the ministries of national governments, but from, but from policy perimeters in cities and local government. Among those, out, those outside political power, in opposition groups and movements, and bottom up from policy implementers, end quote. Next slide. So how might we study policy mobilities and the political in this expanded register? We already study the forces, actors, and interests shaping the world. We focus on ideas, logics, infrastructures, technologies, practices, experts, and expertise, translations, problematizations, solutions and solutioneering, persuasion, fear-mongering, legitimation, marketing, and coalition building. Yet within this wide range, some themes have been pursued more than others. So in thinking about where next and motivated by the argument that we should continue to foreground questions of power, hegemony, and injustice, I want to suggest first a focus on ideas rather than on policies per se, and second, a focus on counter-publics as, as well as on institutions, epistemic, epistemic communities, and markets as key frameworks and outcomes of policy mobilization. So policy is a valid and valuable object of study, yet there are potential limits and problems to the centering of policy in our object of study, no matter how nuanced our, our, de our definition of policy may be. As much as we talk about policy actors broadly defined, policy models, policy knowledge, policy expertise, and so on, are we still too much in the thrall of big P policy? In other words, policies as written and enacted in and through formal institutions of governance. Focusing on mo moving ideas may be a useful way to overcome this problem if you, if you agree that it is a problem. The recent special, special issue of policy and society highlights the worth of ideas as a focus of policy diffusion research. And I was interested that two papers in panel nine of this conference, uh, one by Le Leandro uh, Ferreira and his colleagues, and the other one by Maria Oliveira, um, spoke to these issues of ideas. I haven't been able to read or see these presentations, unfortunately, but I'm definitely interested. <clears throat> For me, the notion of moving ideas is helpful in this context. Moving ideas are ones that circulate, but they're also ones that move people to action by resonating with their deeply held assumptions, desires, and fears. I think most of us already would say that we study moving ideas, like the ideas like governance, choice, the market, justice, sustainable transitions, and so on. Yet I feel that we need to continue to focus on ideas and their ability to persuade and seduce if we are to maintain our commitment to a rich analysis of politics of policy. I would also suggest that we are interested in thinking about the political and policy mobilities 
then we might want to, th to also think about the ways in which policy mobilities create not only markets for the ideas, but also publics and counter publics. And go on to the next slide. <clears throat> in political theory, publics are groups of geographically dispersed strangers who through communication become knowable to each other uh, and to themselves uh, as collectives of common interest and political action. Next slide. Theorists have also identified the actions of counter-hegemonic uh, counter publics, it's getting hard to say, um, or counter-publics. Three points can be made about the, these particular types of publics, and I've, I've listed them on the slide here. Counter-publics are parallel discursive arenas where subordinated groups invent and circulate oppositional counter-discourses and, un and understandings. Um, so this can be, for example, in reference to, to the state or how the world should be better. Secondly, within counter-publics, members oscillate between these supportive enclosed enclaves and more hostile, broader surroundings in which they can test their ideas against others. Counter-hegemonic publics and, and the ideas that emerge in and through numerous contexts um, inclu include spaces like social media, journals, bookstores, publishing companies, lecture series, research centres, academic programmes, conferences, conventions, festivals and local meeting places. My point here is that there is a parallel between the social process of circulating policy models and that through which publics shape their politics. In both cases, communities of actors are constituted and strengthened by the conversations and alliances that operate through them, by the modes of speech, conceptualizations, problematizations, solutions and identities that they encourage and facilitate, circulating texts, informational infrastructures, visual and social media, traveling experts, conferences, local sites of convergence and learning and so on, are all implicated in public formation, just as they are in policy formation. Therefore, we can think of circulating policies as needing publics to gain influence. And we can also suggest that traveling policies create their publics as they travel. In turn, then, there may be something to learn about policy mobilities and also about democracy, governance and politics from the experience of counter-publics. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Moreover, I would argue that even for those of us who study the rise and operation of hegemonic policy mobilities and ideas, there is a resonance here. What we now call neoliberalism was at one point a fringe movement in which its adherents supported each other in various ways, perhaps retreat, retreating to friendly, the friendly confines of a mountaintop retreat in Switzerland, while at other points acting very publicly to change policy. Similarly, in terms of ideas like bus rapid transit and ciclovia, bids and TIFs, participatory budgeting and conditional cash transfers, etc., we can think of all these as ideas moving through and creating publics, counter or otherwise. These might be thought of as public policy publics, and, the, and, and they certainly must be seen as political. Return to the, returning to the present moment and its intersecting crises, we saw the emergence of what we might think of as a mutual aid counter public during the, the early days of the pandemic. The crisis allowed various activists to advocate and amplify ideas and policy proposals that had been long standing but less widely discussed in the, in the general population. These included universal basic income, eviction protections, universal paid sick leave, public health care free meals and free public transit. All these were, were advocated and tested for the future. Moreover, the public sphere is full of debates about which companies and economic sectors should be subsidised or bailed out as uh, the recovery from the, the current crisis continues. And the debates continue also about adequate taxation for the obscenely rich who have become obscenely richer uh, during this pandemic. The crisis has also created opportunities for these counter publics to intertwine through their common concerns and approaches. Their work has meant that counter hegemonic ideas are already traveling around to be implemented. Next slide, please. So I'm a geographer. I may have already mentioned that. This leads me to ask 
what the role of space and place is in all this. I'll conclude by highlight highlighting two spatial aspects of the policy diffusion process. Space and place are context for policy making, but they are not inert. Context is constitutive. Politics and space produce each other. First, we can think about how place plays a role in the development and mobilization of policy models. The co-presence of policy actors in specific places or on particular travels to conferences or site visits has a powerful constitutive role in policy making. This point remains despite the, tr the turn to Zoom in the last year, I'd argue. While Zoom is valuable for transactional and instrumental engagements, physical co-presence builds trust, understanding and common commitment to a cause or a policy model. This is a point made by sociologists like Kevin Hannum, Mimi Scheller and John Uri. For them, the time spent travelling is not dead time that people will always seek to minimise. Rather, um, it's, rather than distinguishing travel from activities, these sociologists want to think that uh, activities occur while on the move and that being on the move can involve sets of occasioned activities, as they put it. These occasioned activities are also situated activities. They act as spaces that are globalising in that the effects of the interactions within them have ramifications over wider geographical, geographical fields in ways that would be different if the situation, if the site, if the place were different. Next slide. Second, we can also consider how, how mobile policy models shape local politics when they arrive from elsewhere. One effect of the pandemic in the global north especially has been, has been the encouragement of debates over how urban spaces might be reconfigured permanently in the wake of, of these temporary changes that have taken place in the last year. Think, for example, of car-free streets or restaurant patios spilling out across public sidewalks, for example. A whole host of planners, architects and designers who tend to call themselves either placemakers or urbanists have advocated for these changes to be permanent post-pandemic. They have pointed to models of public design emerging from places like Copenhagen through the architectural practice of Jan Gehl, for example, who advocates for pedestrian and bike-friendly cities. But these ideas have been promoted at a time when the COVID crisis intersected with heightened recognition of the long-standing crisis of racial injustice, particularly violence uh, against black people by police in cities. Thus, efforts to Copenhagenize North American cities have been met by valid and trenchant critiques from black planners and community actors who point out that what public space is for white, able-bodied, middle-class men is very different from what it is for others in society. They point out that what they call white urbanism of the Copenhagen model is merely a new gloss on long-standing marginalization and stigmatization of certain presences within urban public spaces. As planners Amina Yazin and Daniela Ferguson recently argued, the privatization of public space requires that someone, someone police who is in and who is not allowed in that space and what they are allowed to do and how. White urbanism means spending endless energy on importing European street aesthetics to Canada rather than addressing rampant violence against indigenous black and other racialized people, end quote. Thus, the intersecting crises of the present moment have not only facilitated the circulation of a particular model, but have also redoubled a critique and resistance toward contemporary urban planning and public space design in certain sectors. Next slide. So in this paper, I've thought about policy mobilization through four themes, moving ideas, policy publics, urban spaces, and intersecting crises. My thinking is partial and preliminary, as I said, um, but it, it, I hope that it will, it will benefit a discussion um, among an interdisciplinary community because the wicked problems of our increasingly crisis-filled future will not be effectively addressed by siloed thinking. By the same token, there will be differences of analysis and approach among many of us. Uh, this, is, this need not lead to, to antagonism, Instead, an agonistic approach to the ongoing analysis of policies on the move, one that doesn't strive towards consensus, this, uh, consensus agreements about how to study, uh, but instead values both pluralism and engage critical debate, 
will offer a more vibrant future for our discussions. Osmani, in his introductory comments, uh, said that this conference was a safe space, um, and long may it continue as such. Um, but that's, that safe space can also be a, spa a space um, where we have difficult conversations and we're, when we have disagreements about, about approach, but do so in a way where uh, we can see the validity of the other approaches existing. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eugene, for this uh, presentation. Uh, a lot of uh, content and very, very interesting uh, uh, reflection on the uh, policy mobilities and the context of the, 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 the pandemics, but uh, even beyond that. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's very good when I when I say that this is a very nice space for discussion between different uh, approaches and realms. Uh, uh, I can see the benefits of uh, of these discussions by, for example, uh, hearing you emphasizing in the role of uh, social movements, uh, different concepts of uh, space, as well as the role of uh, ideas in policy uh, transfer, policy mobilities. Uh, and this is very enriching uh, for uh, everyone interested on this uh, similar phenomena, uh, as for example, uh, from a more traditional perspective in public policy analysis, looking into social movements is not uh, not 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 uh, something that we, that that is done usually as uh, 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 more focus is uh, uh, given to governmental uh, and bureaucratic structures which are sort of a usual uh, suspects for public policy analysts and it's very uh, important for us um, and for everyone doing research on this topic to be open-minded and uh, able to uh, see the phenomena from multiple points of view. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, this nice uh, presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask if um, uh, anyone in the audience ha have uh, uh, comments or want to make uh, questions. So if you want to make comments or questions, just uh, uh, write down uh, on uh, on the the chat the chat uh, here on YouTube. Also, uh, Les Depau, if you want to uh, ask a question or make comments, uh, please feel free uh, to do so. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, Let's see if we get anything from the public. Okay, uh, Les, uh, uh, Les Paul has two, two questions. So first, uh, does, uh, he see, does uh, Eugene see uh, global policies creating global publics? And this is the first one uh, from Les Paul. And uh, probably uh, he's writing down the second. Uh, let's uh, we we can wait for it. Or if you want to start uh, replying, Eugene, uh, please uh, feel free to 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 respond. First one, if you want, I can jump in on so, the first one. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We can do it. Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, there's two elements to it. Um, one is a one is about whether um, publics can be global. Uh, often, often in certain literatures around um, demographics and and uh, um, sort of research into into public opinion and so on, or, you know, like political polls and so on. Often, often publics are seen as be as as being constrained at the national level, but. Probably that that sort of like you know the methodological nationalism of that is probably something that that people who study policy transfer and policy um, policy diffusion and poli certainly policy mobilities um, would would bridle against that we want we want we want to we want to be thinking we are thinking about the ways in which um, th these are global phenomena and that policies are created global globally. Um, so I mean I, I think. I think there are there are certain there are there are certainly certain certain concerns uh, that have policy implications and are often responded to by policy that that increasingly do have global 
um, global publics around them. And this uh, clearly the the the, mo the most obvious one in terms of people having having strong views that they're willing to express uh, in various forums is is the climate crisis. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that there's a climate crisis uh, public out there that is increasingly frustrated with the foot dragging of, of large corporations and governments. Um, and certain, certainly um, movements like the Fridays for the Future movement over the last couple of years um, bring that bring those concerns to the streets, but but clearly, um, if we want if we want to think about about the politics of of claims being made about about alternative policies and the, and claims against the state, um, we c we can't really do that, especially on a global level, without thinking about the role of social media as a forum for uh, for for this type of organising. So so. Um, a slightly long way of saying yes, I suppose. Um, I think I think by the same token that the, there can also be publics operating at different scales. Um, but but you know, without being too trite about it, obviously we we live in a in, in a network world where where um, most people, if not all people, have have decent access to to the internet and social media, and 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 clearly there's something. Um, there's something there that we need to take seriously and, and have have been for a long time obviously um that's not to suggest that the that the internet is a public space in any sort of uh, you know a classical way it clearly is a privatized space but the, i think there's a difference between saying that something um is not a public space in a classical sense and on the other hand saying that I, even a even a privatized space uh, can be a can be a location for the creation of publics um, and we can think about that even in the context of the you know in the past um, bookstores and and conference venues and so on would have been those you know privatized spaces that were also uh, places of of the generation of publics um secondly uh, maybe I'll just read it out here from uh, from the, what I can see. Um, do do I see do I see counter hegemonic groups working more together? For example, BLM and Aboriginal groups with the disabled, etc. Perhaps under the umbrella of climate change or urban protests. I'm wondering about whether Paul. This is Leslie talking. Um, he's wondering about whether publics are fragmented in their opposition to hegemony. Or coalescing. Um, I mean, I th I I think I I didn't I didn't say this very explicitly or or strongly in my presentation, which probably means that I'm still thinking through exactly how far to go with this point. But I think um, I kind of gestured towards the idea that these protests are um, coming together. Uh, seemingly increasingly, and probably being exacerbated by crises. Um, so, so the ways in which the climate crisis, uh, or the or the or a cl sort of climate change public, um, inter has intersected w with uh, with protests around uh, around anti black violence, um, and has has definitely had had uh, connections to um, to mutual aid groups. Uh, often, the, often the people involved in one of those groups are involved in others. Then, you know, people can be involved in in various various movements, and I think um, the the uh, the idea of inter intersectionality as a way of um, as a way of thinking about how the world is 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 very evident um, in the context of these these recent protests and the, the recent crises, where um, the discussion, for example, of say something something more concrete policy wise, like the like the Green New Deal, especially in the US, um, is very much framed as being a social justice issue that that brings together poor people's campaigns, um, uh, the, the Black Black Lives Matter campaigns, um, and of course concerns for the environment and so on. Um, so. But at the same time, maybe my reticence was that clearly, clearly there are differences among these these communities too. Um, what what uh, what a better environment means um, within cities is clearly is clearly different um, among different groups of planners. Uh, so so in the in the article that I quoted from Yazin and Ferguson. Uh, those are two Canadian planners who are who are talking about the problematic nature of of the taking over of of public sidewalks by by private patios and so on in restaurants, and their their argument 
is is about is about racial inequity, but it's also very it's also very much about uh, about disability and and the the cutting off of access uh, for disabled people um, when when car, when roads are are closed down perhaps or and certainly when sidewalks are are blocked. Um, so I think there's a lot of intersectionality going on, although of course there's always fragmentation going on in, in political movements too. Um, but I, I, I kind of wonder if, if it'll be interesting to see how long this goes on for, but it seems like the current moment of intersecting crisis has, has created these, these opportunities for alliances and coalitions around, around visions of new policies like the Green New Deal, for example. Thank you. Thank you, Les, for the question. Thank you, Eugene, for your uh, answer. Uh, we don't have uh, so far questions from the public. I wanted to ask uh, uh, another question for uh, Eugene. I was thinking about this, uh, the this dynamics of uh, uh, policy diffusion and uh, conquering publics and uh, the counter publics. And uh, this made me think about, uh, for example, uh, the far right movements and the diffusion of far right policies, uh, which uh, are often uh, supported by uh, social movements, we, we can see them in different parts of uh, of the world. Uh, and uh, my question is: uh, Do do this follows the same uh, a similar logic? Uh, what are your uh, uh, reflections? Your quick reactions about this uh, this topic? It's a very good question and very relevant. Um, when I was writing my notes for this and I was given examples, um, I had a voice in the back of my head the whole time saying that you you need to think about, you know, um, the various right wing populists uh, close to your close to your home, as many among among other places in the world where these right wing populist movements have, have capitalized on people's disaffection with neoliberalism and with inaction on climate change and all, all these other issues. And it, yeah, um, these, you know, these far right populist groups um, have used very similar tactics to uh, to the groups that I mentioned. They are also counter publics. They, in the sense that they um, that they are they they are presenting a counter hegemonic discourse that challenges um, challenges the sort of liberal um, liberal neoliberal uh, globalizing view of of how the world should operate. Uh, they just do it from a very different perspective, clearly from uh, from the groups that I talked about. Um, I I personally don't study these these groups, but I think that that this is a and clearly, I felt uncomfortable uh, even mentioning them. Um, but that's that's problematic, I think, analytically and probably politically to just to try and just avoid them. That's probably not useful. Um, and thinking about populist poli uh, populist policies, if that's a thing, um, even though many of these people are trying to, you know. Tear everything down. Um, the circulation of populist policy models and and ideas and so on probably is another another area that uh, would be valuable for research uh, in this general realm um, because it's clearly relevant and clearly has massive effects on people's lives and deaths as we've seen in the last year. Um, so yeah, you're right, and uh, you you saw the gap that I was trying to um, close my eyes and and avoid. In, in what I was saying, there definitely there's definitely something there too. Thank you very much, uh, Eugene, uh, for this uh, this comment. Uh, so uh, I I was thinking about this during your uh, presentation, and uh, uh, this is much. Uh, clear now what uh, that that we need to uh, start investigating uh, doing research also on this uh, the diffusion of far right uh, populist policies and uh, the the movements that are supporting it so uh, again another tip for people that want to find a new research object or do uh, a master or a phd in in the area uh so thank you very much for for this uh this this uh for for this this comments um 
I don't see any any uh, questions from uh, from the audience. Uh, the other audience is shy today, uh, so I think we can move to the the end of the this uh, panel, uh, this uh, this plenary, uh, which is also uh, the end of the the conference. Uh, so. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, start uh, thanking everyone. It was a, a long journey uh, to arrive here. So I'd like to start uh, uh, thanking uh, everyone that uh, has uh, participated in this uh, uh, conference uh, so far. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, it was a huge challenge uh, and uh, there was a lot uh, of effort put in, the, in this uh, event to make it uh, happen. Uh, so I'd like to thank all the conveners, all the panel organizers, uh, all the scientific committee uh, for their support and for their encouragement uh, for uh, the event. Uh, I would I would like also to thank all the participants for uh, being with us and sharing uh, the results of their research in such uh, complex times. Uh, uh, so I really appreciate that we uh, in the organization we appreciated uh, all these uh, efforts. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Miwa for all the assistance uh, in this uh, in the organization of this event. Uh, without the technical uh, support, uh, this uh, conference online wouldn't have been possible. And um, uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank all the institutions that were partners of uh, of the conference. Uh, so uh, first, uh, uh, the College of uh, Public Policy of the Hamad bin Khalifa University for supporting the event. Uh, Leslie Pau, the, the dean of uh, CCP, uh, it was uh, very important to have uh, this uh, the support and to make this uh, conference happen. I would also like to thank uh, the Brazilian Center of Analysis and Planning, uh, the Federal University of Sao Paulo and the Laboratory of Public Policies uh, with, that were important partners uh, for the conference and the publishers uh, who joined uh, that joined us for the book launch and uh, uh, made uh, discount prices available for uh, everyone interested uh, on the the most recent uh, publications in um, in the uh, in the, the, the book launch uh, uh, sessions uh, of the conference so the these uh, publishers are Routledge, uh, Edward Elgar and Palgrave. So thank you very much for, for everything. Uh, I know just before closing, uh, uh, Professor Leslie Paul would like to uh, say a few words. And uh, I, will, I will now uh, hand, uh, hand, over to, hand over to him. Great. Thank you very much, Osmani. Well, uh, the, the closing words I want to share with uh, with the audience and all of the participants is actually uh, closing words on behalf of the participants and uh, and the audience and these are closing words and closing thanks to Osmani and his team for having um, put together a remarkable uh, event over over a number of months um, the he's already thanked all the members of, of his of his team so i'd like to sort of reiterate that and reinforce that i also want to uh, to underscore and remind people how extraordinary this entire uh event was um back uh, when um when this was supposed to have happened back last year um osmani i think uh, as anybody would have um, entertained the idea of either canceling simply uh, holding it in, in some truncated form but uh, after much thought he decided to to take a much more courageous stance and path which was to um, not just have a short two or three day virtual conference but to extend it over a number of months deepen it and enrich it through um, panels and plenaries and support from publishers everything that you've heard uh, him uh, him mention and so um, what resulted from this is something extraordinary I think and I would also underscore the point that uh, that Osmani has this is only um, one of a series of events over the last number of years and in a sense it's a culmination of efforts that have created a global community of scholars and 
uh, including practitioners and researchers and students all dedicated to policy diffusion and policy transfer issues. So he's not only managed with his team and his colleagues to put together an extraordinary conference, but uh, he's also built a global community as a result of this conference and, um, and the previous one. So on behalf of everyone that was uh, part of this adventure, thank you very much, Osmani, and, um, and, and thank you for all of your efforts and all of the work of, uh, of your colleagues in, uh, in, in this extraordinary event. Thank you very much, uh, Les, uh, for this uh, kind uh, words. Uh, uh, so I, I don't know <laughs> what else to say. It's uh, always a very complex uh, to to conclude such uh, events, and especially online. Uh, uh, so uh, I would like to uh, thank again. Uh, Leslie Paul, Eugene McCain for being uh, with us today for this uh, great uh, discussion we had. Uh, everyone for uh, the event uh, in, in general. So everything is uh, is going to be uh, here in, in this YouTube channel so you can watch uh, everything later. And uh, yeah, so uh, it was great to produce, uh, produce this. So uh, Thank you very much. Uh, don't forget to listen to our uh, playlist uh, in Spotify. There is a very nice playlist with uh, Brazilian music uh, for you to celebrate a, a closing of this uh, this event. And uh, that's it. So thank you very much. It was uh, great uh, to to be with you. So bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>